Hi everyone and welcome to our last session of the day. It's wonderful to see all of you and I hope that you're all enjoying the, the conversation so far. So the last session of today is really about a, a topic that I would say is on the tip of most people's tongues at the moment and that topic is chat GBT. So for anyone that's missed it um, or has managed to escape uh, the, the chat GPT model or bubble as it's known, um, what it is, is it's an artificially intelligent chatbot that uses natural language uh, processing to create human-like conversational dialogue. Um, the language model responds to questions and, compose, and can compose written content such as articles, email copy, code, social media posts, essays, and emails. And OpenAI, who are the creators of ChatGPT, have recently uh, released a new release, which is ChatGPT4, so really hot off the press. Um, and to give you an example of ChatGPT in practice, we actually asked ChatGPT to name the session for us. Um, and what they, they came up with uh, was our session title, which is Revolutionizing Higher Education uh, ChatGPT and the future of learning. Um, so this may amuse uh, some of our some of our guys um, who are joining today, and even our panelists, that that they acknowledge uh, that they're a disruptor in this higher education space. So we're very much looking forward to to having this discussion uh, with our wonderful set of panelists today um, to have a look at, at how um, we're seeing that sort of disruptive nature in, in higher ed. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our wonderful set of panellists um, who are joining us today. Um, so first uh, up, we have Alexandra Mihai from the University of Maastricht, who many of you may have heard speaking um, earlier today. Um, she's an assistant professor at the School of Business and Economics um, and has an expensive, a very extensive background in innovation and definitely a very strong perspective on chat GPT and what it means um, in the place of education. I read a great LinkedIn article that she shared, so I'm sure she'll be happy to share a bit more on that perspective today. Uh, so welcome, Alexandra. Um, we then have uh, Dominic Lukesh, uh, I had to make sure I said that correctly, um, who is our Assistive Technology Officer and is part of the Centre for Teaching and Learning at the University of Oxford. Um, his role has been around researching and educating people on how tech can make them more productive in reading, writing and organisation. Um, and he too has had much to say about chat GPT um, on LinkedIn. So if you're not already see it, seeing, I would very much recommend checking it out. Um, and then last but not least, uh, we have Dr. Chris Kubiek from the Open University, um, who's a senior lecturer in health and social care, uh, and also a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Um, Chris uh, and Dominic and Alexandra recently joined discussions about ChatGPT um, internally within McGraw-Hill. So it's an absolute pleasure um, to have them join us today um, to talk about it with all of you. Um, now, before we get going, I just wanted to share uh, that our discussion is incomplete without you. So if you have any questions, any thoughts that you'd like to share, by all means, feel free to share any thoughts in the chat, whether that's commentary um, or just general dialogue. Um, and of course, if you've got any burning questions that you'd like our panelists to answer, uh, we will have some time for Q&A um, at the end as well, which we can cover live today. And obviously anything we don't cover live, uh, we'll make sure we take away and come back to you after. Um, so without further ado, we'd like to kick off off, um, with our first sort of piece around um, what ChatGPT is um, and for that I'd like to introduce Dominic um, to take the floor or stand even. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, thank you Gita I hope everybody can hear me so ho hello everybody I'm gonna try to do a quick uh, introduction of uh, the five key things that I think people should know and often don't seem to be quite aware of when it comes to ChatGDP. I'm trying to do it in five-ish minutes, which means I'll speak quite quickly and cover quite a, a few things at speed, uh, but I'm hoping that people will be able to ask questions and, and elaborate and we can come back to any points that are not clear. So here are the five things. So first, ChatGDP and all of the models today, systems, they have multiple building blocks. and uh, under the hood, they don't really reason, they make predictions. Those predictions are limited by how far in the past they can see, how much text uh, context they can see. 
And uh, that's all they are doing. They, there is no database. There is no copy or paste of information, no working memory. And uh, they don't learn live. Many people make the misconception that they, they learn live, but they but you can sort of correct them as part of a conversation. So those are the five things. And I want to kind of use those as jumping points and helping us understand what all of it, all of that does. Now, uh, but the the key warning, the thing that I see people often uh, go go wrong is that they type in the first thing that comes to mind, their mind to chat GDP, and they're either incredibly impressed or incredibly disappointed. And that is their impression of the tool. But in fact, this is an entirely new universe of things that are happening to us. And we need to investigate it systematically. And over time, we're still discovering all the things in Canada cannot do. New improvements are happening to the system and similar systems. And we are kind of at the cusp of a new, a new time of exploration. So let's go uh, back to the five uh, top five things. So first, the building blocks. So we can start with the building blocks just uh, in the name ChatGTP, which stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer in the chat format. And the, I'm going to start at the bottom. Transformer really means that it can be trained to predict from really long context. The previous AI technologies were doing very similar things, but transform, transformed the way how much data we can, we can take and how easy we can train it to do things that we're seeing it do now. Pre-trained stands for the fact that we can do this really complicated, expensive, and time-consuming training process on lots of data, and then we can fine-tune it on smaller sets of data, such as within a company or a book or, uh, or uh, a particular field, and that doesn't take nearly as much effort. Generative means that we're no longer just labeling things, like Google Photos labels your photos, but actually we're generating whole descriptions, whole strings of text, or sometimes even images. And chat is the bit is the bit where, where it's actually answering questions. So as I, as I kept saying, it's predicting what comes next. And the next thing to a question could be another question. But they were able to fine tune it on uh, conversations, which means that when you ask it a question, it knows, quote unquote, that it's a question. And the next thing comes up is an answer rather than another question. That's kind of what ChatGDP uh, stands for. Now, the way uh, we can think of it as a as stack of uh, of interfaces. So at the very bottom is something called a foundation model. That's the model that knows all the predictions. And on top of that, we can either build products like ChatGDP, which is a whole product, or Consensus, which is another AI-based product. And uh, or we can just put features into different applications. Like for example, Notion, a note-taking app just announced you can, uh, you can brainstorm within using Ch a ChatGDP or PowerPoint. There's already AI features like the designer feature and so on. So, but it's all rests on these foundation models. And there's loads and loads of them uh, out there. But actually, even though there's, this looks like a lot on this, on this slide, um, there are relatively few because not that many companies can afford to, uh, to have ones. But um, these, there's, uh, nevertheless, you know, it seems like a lot. But in fact, there's just relatively few. And we have this foundation model with an API. And then we can a company can buy access to that API application programming interface. And they can either fine tune it on custom data or human feedback or uh, they can add out another custom workflow or interface. And there's loads of companies out there. I'm not going to go through them. But we just heard those announcements last week. And I'm going to paste in the chat a link to, I did a quick write-up on that of that on LinkedIn, as Vita mentioned. And Google announced this is all coming to be inside Gmail and Google Docs. Microsoft announced all of that to be part of the Office suite in the coming months or maybe years. Uh, and But in a way, all of that is happening exactly that same thing. There's a, there's a big model at the bottom, and it's being uh, it's being improved. Uh, it's being sort of fine-tuned on different tasks. There's a new company that also launched yesterday called Teachermatic, which does the same thing for uh, for teachers. So you can type in, for example, in the chat GDP, write 10 learning objectives for a beginner course about web design, or you can go to Teachermatic and they've sort of pre-defined some common teacher tasks and they've fine-tuned some of some of that on on different aspects and gave some interface and you can get that same result out. So that's another example of how the same thing kind of is, uh, can come through the base, the same foundation model, but through different interfaces. Now what the foundation models are doing, it are, they are predicting things. However, they're predicting things so well that it can seem as if they're doing much more. So it's easy to be deceived by the appearances. So for example, I can, t I can ask you to make a list of tropical fruits organized by region they come from. And I can ask it to put things into a table. Well, that looks like the sort of thing if I was doing, if I were doing that that thing, what I would be doing, I'd be using lots of logic and memory. You know, sort of comparing things, organizing them, retrieving from memory, storing them. 
you know, and I'm, it might look like this. You're like, look at my memory, list of fruits. Is the fruit tropical? Write it out. If not, go for, look for another, another fruit and so on. But ChatGTP is not doing any of it. Doesn't, doesn't have any memory, doesn't have any, any logic. All it's doing is it takes up all the preceding text, breaks it down to tokens, assigns certain numbers of the to tokens and predicts the next token and then just repeats it over and over and over again. It doesn't even see things like we do, like letters, words, sentences, paragraphs, none of that. It just sees tokens. And you can try that if you go to tokenizer on by OpenAI. You can just put any text in and we'll show you what the tokens look like. Uh, but you can also go get token ID. So in fact, it doesn't even see tokens. It sees numbers. And you can see, for example, those three numbers I highlighted there uh, represent the word Unicode, but there would be different numbers for small uh, capital and, 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 and small letter Unicode. The same goes if there's a space, the token will look different. So you can see the number one is represented by different numbers in, uh, in these different sort of equations. Different languages are very different. So if you look at English, you see a lot of the tokens are words for, for other languages like French or Czech or Russian or, or German or Arab, Arabic or Chinese. There, those tokens don't even resemble words. They're just strange subwords. So all of that kind of would, would suggest that ChatGPT would would be, wouldn't be good at things like rhyming, wouldn't be good at things like finding patterns in letters. And it isn't very good at it, but it shouldn't be able to do those things at all. However, you can see in this example, I'm not going to go into it, that it actually can do a relatively good job at a very difficult task on, on check. Uh, I'm not going to explain the details. Now, how does it know all of that, all of those things? I can do any of it is, well, it trains on trillions of words and it can actually, it assigns really complicated numbers to those, uh, to those words, which are called embeddings. And adds them up into sentences and it can chunk similar sentences together, similar words go together. And then it takes all of that, uh, all of that sort of difficult math, I'm not going to go into details, and it starts predicting. What is the next most likely word? And then it predicts one of those words, not always the, the top one, but it just predicts one of them. So you can again go to OpenAI, they'll, they'll let you play with this and show how that kind of works. And with all of that, it manages to produce really credible output. Kind of amazingly credible, unexpectedly credible output. And, uh, but all of that is limited by the amount of context it can, it can take. So for example, <clears throat> and uh, the chat G GPT-3, which is the foundation model under chat GTP up until now, uh, has 2000 tokens of uh, previous text, which is not about 1500 words. GPT-4 that we just announced last week, and you can only have access to it if you pay for gpt uh, ChatGDB Plus has 8,000 words or 8,000 tokens, and it's going to be increasing to 32,000 tokens. Now, what does that do for you? That actually does an interesting thing because every new token that is being generated in the response eats into the context window. So it's kind of eating in what you put in previously. And here's an example of what happens if you put in 2,000 words text or about, about thereabouts in the ChatGTP and ask it to extract all the people from it. It will eventually, as you keep asking for more, find people that are not in the text. It was just going to predict, OK, these people could be in that sort of context, but none of them are actually in it. That's the 2,000 uh, token limit. If you go to the 8,000 token limit, which is GPT-4, all of a sudden, it does it right. It gets all the people, tells you who they are, and you can ask it to generate a table uh, that, that says what they said about uh, in the article about what they were saying and where they're from and so on. Again, this is what a longer context window will give you, and uh, we that, that you know that's something that we kind of have to always be mindful of. How much is it trying to predict from? Because the other thing that we need to be aware of, there is no database, there's no copy and paste. Uh, so it looks like it's looking things up, copying them and pasting them, but it is not doing any of that. It's just predicting the next token one after the other. It's kind of bizarre that it can do any of it, but that's what it's doing because it was trained on, all, on almost a trillion tokens and has 175 billion parameters about, uh, the, about those tokens, about how they relate to each other. It is kind of, it's really hard to imagine what, what it would be. So we have, that's why we have to keep, tro we, have to be, we have to be trying things as we go along, right? It can even do things like, like that. It can even do things like counting. So I can write a little story about captain going out to, sh to sea with, ships with a name to ships and then coming back with uh, fewer ships but i don't use the number in the stories and it can actually count the ships that went out count the ships that returned count the ships that were lost at sea uh, write about it and put it into a table that is pretty amazing uh but 
you cannot ever trust anything like that it says because it's never copying, pasting, it's never counting, it's just predicting. So for example, you can ask it, I ask it, give me a table of European capitals where they're sorted by distance from Prague. And you can see that, for example, it's a Vatican City is, is 200 um, kilometers away from, from Rome. Even, you know, it didn't quite say that in, in that doses, but in that table, there's no common sense there. So every time you give it, it gives you a number, you must not trust it. Uh, it can count some things, but up to, up to a point. So for example, it cannot count words very easily or characters, anything like that. And you cannot even trust it when you go to um, a company like Microsoft who have integrated into Bing, where it does a big search. And, uh, and it tries to extract information, quote unquote, uh, from the things it finds. Again, it's always just predicting. And in this case, I ask it, find me check idioms about animals. And uh, it found me three lovely idioms. The only problem with it is they don't exist. And it also gave me links where it says it found them. And if you go to those links, they are not there. They're just <laughs> predicted and uh, predicted um, something that might make sense, but it does not exist. And also the important thing is this is GPT-4. That's the long context. So that's an important thing. The context window is really good. It does amazing things, but only up to a point. And uh, doesn't even have access to its own training data. So it cannot even look inside its own sort of what it was trained on and, and, and spit things out. Somebody has said, it, it looks like it has read every book in the library once, distilled statistical relationships between words in that library and then burned the library down. That's kind of what it what it did, right? So that's an important thing to remember. Very often deceptive. And finally, it does not learn live, but it can be corrected. And the reason it doesn't learn live because it takes days, weeks, sometimes even months to train the foundation model and millions, uh, millions of dollars. Uh, but uh, and it then takes even more time to then fine tune it on human feedback. We, nobody disclosed that amount, so we don't know exactly. Right? But it is a, what's called a few shot learning. It can follow examples. There was a famous paper that introduced this revolution about four years back saying language models are a few shot learners that shows that if you give it examples, it will learn from those examples in that one conversation. The underlying model doesn't improve, doesn't send it back to some sort of database, but it will improve in that conversation, can correct it. So for example, here's an example of, I said, you know, try a different answer or do something differently. I'm not gonna go through, the, through that. So that's a really important lesson to learn. You can correct it as part of a conversation, but you're not teaching it for, the, for future conversations. So the key lesson for practical use, you should really think of it as a human when you're trying to give it things to do. But when you're interpreting the result, always think of it, okay, it's only just auto-completing things. How much can I trust what it's giving me? So that's kind of that. That's that dichotomy that's really hard to, to keep constantly those two contradictory things in mind. And that's why um, also it's more successful the more you what's called prompt, do what's called prompt engineering, and which means when you engineer your prompts, you should, you should aim towards giving it more examples and context, but being mindful of the length of the context window. So things you can down, narrow down the context, give, be more specific, give examples, specify the style you want the answers in, specify the persona, for example, pretend you're an expert in this field, ask it to correct itself. So those are all things you can do. What ChatGPT do is a matter of experimentation for us to discover. We know the first principles, we know the math that's going on under the hood, but we don't know what all that math will give us when we actually try it out. So that is the important thing to remember. The final lesson, don't just ask it, don't just give it, don't just tell it, iterate. And uh, in the words of ChatGTP, we can even ask ChatGTP to write a limerick about those things. And here it is, what it's like. And so that's finally, uh, I'm going to um, end here. I think I overran quite a bit. Uh, but if you would like to I keep track of new developments and new tools, if you'd like to have a look at any of those, I pasted in the chat a link to Azure Tools, which is where I keep adding uh, more, uh, more information about as, as it comes out. And uh, the final words of wisdom that I'll have is um, tools change, people remain the same. So we still have to think not just about the tools, but also about how we're using them and what we can do with them. So uh, thank you very much. And um, I'm going to... Uh, pause, stop here, and hand over to the rest of the panel to uh, contribute their thoughts. Thank you so much, Dominic. Um, and I wonder, that's probably a great place to start. Um, Alexandra, Chris, um, any initial thoughts uh, based on the various pieces um, that Chris sort of took us through a whistle-stop tour of, of chat GPT? Uh, but any initial thoughts from, from the both of you? So, so I, I, 
I, no, sorry, you go, Alexandra. You go first. Thank you. Just very, very briefly, thank you again, Dominic, for this. I think every time I hear you, I learn new things about ChatGPT, and uh, that's that's good. Uh, but I also become aware how little we generally know about what's going on under the hood, as you said, actually, mm -hmm. um, you know, the math behind it, and also just remembering the fact that it just predicts. So I think it just goes back to the fact that we need to both educate ourselves and uh, constantly educate our students to, to be able to work with this within the parameters that are there you know not imagining that it can do things it cannot do uh, or or you know so overestimating it or underestimating it so i think that's super super important to remember yeah completely agree alexandra um, and chris so I, I think dominic's point is actually quite important and that is to to use the tool to not exhort to, to, to not um ignore it not to rely on the stuff that's written about it but to use it and to iterate so i, I can and, and the tool can do some quite remarkable things so on one hand i can ask it a question like can you explain why um what what has meant that the conservative government is like um germany in the 1930s it understands that illusion and is prepared to explain it and even understands it as an inflammatory comment at the same time i can ask it can you explain the joke why is a banjo um What's the difference between a banjo and an onion? Um, and I say that the punchline to the joke is that um, nobody cries when a banjo is cut up. The, the chat GPT understands the concept of a joke, but doesn't seem to be able to understand, explain why it's funny. Mm -hmm. So the, the trick with it, I think, is to keep playing and iterating and working through it and, and engaging in these conversations. In, in my first attempt at working with it, I was struck by how bland and robotic the writing was. Mm -hmm. And, and I'll, I'll pick up um, Dominic's point about prompt engineering, that as I started to play with it, I found that I could get different voices out of it. So um, I, I could get it to describe a, a visit to Stonehenge as if um, it was written by Tom Sawyer, and I'd write a very good impersonation of Tom Sawyer. I could get it to describe a visit to Stonehenge as if it was written by John Lydon, and would start a piece of writing with the phrase, um, Stonehenge, what a bloody joke. So it's it's a remarkable tool, but it's something for us as engineer um, educators to work with and fiddle with it and come to understand what it can and can't do. Thanks, Chris. Um, and I guess um, one of the things that sort of chat GPT sort of recognises when we when we um, asked it was that it sees itself as, as a disruptor and probably one of the biggest disruptors since the internet. Um, so what, what what do you got, what do you all feel has got them got us worried, excited? Um, yeah. What sort of do you see as as those sort of worries or excitements? Um, Dominic, do you want to take this one to start? Yeah, I mean, well, I was actually quite surprised at the reasonably, you know, given how how big a deal this is how reasonably balanced and considered most of the responses have been, even in the media, right? Given sort of what we can see in the media. So, you know, so I'm not necessarily saying that it was all, all perfect, but in general, you know, people, obviously the cheating was the first thing that people started writing about, but in a way, I, I'm surprised that even, even sort of relatively sensationalistic accounts were always quite balanced saying, you know, students cheat anyway, and this is, you know, it actually can be used as a tool, can be beneficial. So it's it's not that it's impossible to find alarmist and sort of overly, uh, you know, over exaggerated accounts of this. But on balance, people who have sort of played with it, who thought about it, who've sort of given some thought, have come out with a reasonably balanced uh, sort of account of it. The one thing that I think we're not appreciating uh, is that we, the amount of, uh, or how much we don't know what's coming next. And it's because about three years ago, somebody, uh, Melanie Mitchell, a famous, a famous um, uh, artificial intelligence researcher going way decades back, did a survey of artificial intelligence specialists. And she asked them, how, how do, do you think, how likely is it, do you think that AI will ever be able to do meaningful language work not even of the sort that HGTB can do. And only 46% of them thought it was even achievable. And to be honest, I'll be completely honest, I was one, of, she didn't ask me personally, but I would have been one of them. And I was completely wrong. Nevertheless, we've also seen lots of very excited predictions in the past that were completely wrong in the opposite direction. We just don't know. Microsoft made a big announcement with the co-pilot, Google the same with Google Docs. The thing that struck me was how corporate those announcements were. Up until then, 
the announcements have been all very sort of saying, this is what it can do, this is where it's bad at. And OpenAI mm -hmm. is very good at this. I always say, this is where the limitations are. None of that was in the Google corporate announcement. None of that was in the Microsoft corporate announcements. And I sort of vaguely think to me that indicates that it's not going to be as, it's going to be the usual stuff when people announce massive features. They never quite work quite as well as you, as you hope. Yeah. They're really good. Everything that we have in ChatGDP, we're going to have. It's going to be really good, but it's going to be limited by all sorts of contingencies. And also the GPT-3, the 4, was very much an incremental, significant, real improvement on GPT-3, 3.5, but incremental in the same, it's not the same jump as going from GPT-2 to GPT-3 was. And I think that those are all important things to kind of keep in mind. It could be incremental from now on, or there could be another revolution around the corner we're not quite envisioning yet. So that's, and I am completely agnostic. I'm not saying one or the other. I just want to say we don't know, and we have to keep that in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a very good point around the pace of technology is such that it, it does keep moving and it moves. So what will be the next thing that will come? Um, but it, the, the reality is it's here and it's here to stay and it's uh, most likely the future direction. So we we as, an, as a community, as an industry have to have to be able to accept that and, and work with it. Um, Chris, what's your sort of perspective, I guess, in terms of how you see why perhaps it's got people worried um, or maybe excited in education? Well, I, I, I think I think these both voices in this. One is, is of course, we've seen the material that's talked about the essay being dead, the abject horror of educators, the, um, the fear that we're going to have to change assessment. So uh, in at least in our institution, there have already been some initial experiments with ChatGPT where they have um, asked, where they've asked our, our markers to mark output from from the AI and compare it and to see if they can detect whether it's a human. They've found that, that our markers can't detect whether it's a human and that they can give it a grade that's a reasonable grade. I, mm -hmm. I think the other way that it's, it's created or disrupted education is it's injected a kind of... Um, a distrust into the system, at least among some people. But I see this as part of a growing wave in terms of the role of, of technology in education. So, so 10 years ago, when I was doing academic conduct or academic misconduct work, I'd find that students would crib from reports that find online. About four years ago, there was another disruptor in the system, which were these essay sharing websites, which operate on a kind of, I'll show you mine if you show me yours principle. So they ask students to upload their assignments, and then they'll be given an assignment to someone else's to have a look at. So these have started to appear in, in our ac academic misconduct cases. And just to be clear, that very few students actually cheat. It's probably around 1% of students who are engaged in serious misconduct of some kind. Since Chat GPT has come on on the um, the scene, people have been talking about this, and this has contributed to a kind of culture of mistrust, which in itself is surprising, considering that these tools have been around for a couple of years already. Although yeah. this has been one of the primary ones, so mm -hmm. certainly we'll need to update plagiarism policy. But we're going to have to get to grips with something much more fundamental, and that is to actually have productive conversations about chat GPT, have conversations about what it can do and what it can't do and its role it can play in, in research or essay writing, um, and to also start to think about its role in assessment and possibly think about the way in which we can change assessments, the way in which we change our teaching. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, very, very good points, and especially like the, the connection that it that it has to assessment um, and rethinking perhaps um, how how we're going to utilise it. And great to hear that there are already pilots happening. Um, and like you said, there is a percentage that will always cheat, um, and that's just something we can't really do. But interesting to have a statistic that it was one percent of those times. So no, very interesting. Thank you, um, Alexandra. Um, from your perspective. Um, how do you feel about sort of the, I guess, the fear that or the excitement? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I don't have that much to add because I think most of the points are made, but I will accentuate some of them. So I think on the one hand, it's good that it opened the, a debate that, you know, that it disrupted in that sense, uh, academia, in the sense that it opened a debate uh, that probably was sort of underneath or at least a little bit opened already with the pandemic, but continued uh, very, very, um, in a very, very tormented way in the past months. Uh, and that debate uh, on the one hand shows the sort of 
um, academic culture with its weaknesses and strengths, uh, but also, um, especially one of the weakness or one of the bad sides of it, I think, was this uh, misconception that everyone would cheat or cheat. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this really just got uh, got emphasized by this debate. And I, I, that was one ugly part of it, let's say, uh, in my opinion. Uh, the the potential in it, I think, uh, to to uh, redesign assessment and to re you know. Uh, conceptualize uh, assessment, what we assess, how we assess, and so on, uh, is is really nice, especially with my educational uh, uh, developer hat on. I think uh, that's something I we wanted for a long time to uh, engage faculty with, and I think now they uh, finally feel that they might be the case. Uh, as I said already with the pandemic, that was a little bit happening, but now uh, the need became clearer. Uh, so I think there is a lot of work there, uh, but um, also, I was quite disappointed. I, I do agree that some of the accounts were um, sort of nuanced, as Dominic said, but I did see quite a lot of exaggerations on both sides as well, uh, both from institutions and from people, individuals, uh, and especially when you read about, you know, let's go back to handwritten exams in big exam halls, or uh, let's ban the tool, or let's ban essays as an assessment mode. Um, you know, I think these are, these are really exaggerations. But also on the other side of the coin, you know, you see things uh, like, yeah, let's all use ChatGPT because, you know, it's great. So mm -hmm. this technical technological determinism, which is also not very healthy. So again, the idea is, as Chris and Dominic mentioned, to have the discussions in a balanced way um, and really realistically look at what it can do. Should we be afraid or, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, uh, but let's, mm -hmm. all, let's talk openly about it among us with our students and with everyone around. Yes, thank you so much, Alessandra. That's a very good point. I think the the key takeaway is around the the balance, because um, there is a balance, right? Um, there's a balance is the fact that it, that it's out there, um, but you know there needs to be a very balanced conversation. Balance has been the key word um, about how how we either utilize it or where we utilize and what place it what place it has in higher education. Um, and the reality very much is, you know, I, I head up a marketing department at McGraw Hill, and you know, ChatGPT can write write copy, it can write social media post you can ask it questions there's it's going to be in work you know by the time these students graduate and come out um, into the world of work they'll they'll be interfacing with this technology so uh, we almost have to adopt and, and get comfortable that this technology is out there um, and as you said um Alexandra, you know there's been a lot of time through the pandemic to sort of really reassess assessment how we use technology where we use technology and it all has a place uh, but i guess with it being so new um there's a although it's been around for some time, but it's gathered so much attention of late that it's finding its right place and balance. Um, so I'll definitely take that away, um, particularly because we're, we're starting to use it ourselves at work and people will interact with it you know, forever more. So no, very, very interesting to have that perspective. Now I'm super conscious we've got lots and lots of questions coming in. Uh, thank you everyone who are sending in um, the questions. Um, but before we, we start to, to tackle those, um, all of you obviously have close ties to, to higher education institutions. So how how do you feel universities need to change or adapt? Um, you know, what, what sort of shift are they going to need to, to take to, to embrace something like this? Um, what can you sort of see as being the, the big things that they're going to need to, to change? Um, I think we talked about balance already, that being one of the first ones, but are there any other pieces that you see higher education institutions are going to need to do when they think about the role of chat GBT. Um, I'm not sure who wants to take that first. Uh, I can come to, to you, Chris, if, if you don't mind. Well, I, I, I think we've started to see various changes. We know that the, mm -hmm. the International Baccalaureate, for example, is allowing it as a source. Um, schools in New York are, are, are trying to block access to it. And you can go home and ask chat GPT how to get around the um, blocking and I'll give you instructions on how to do it and you go back into class. I, I think that there, there's some emerging stuff around the use of it, of it in education mm -hmm. and particularly playing with its limitations. So yeah. it, it's, it's another research tool. It's a research mm -hmm. tool mm -hmm. with limitations. And by working yeah. with these limitations, I, th I think that you can lead students to, to actually engage with material um, in much, you know, in, in a different way. So, for example, mm. I, I, you can use um, the tool to practice a language and, and have a conversation on any topic you like. You can engage it in a debate. You can ask it questions. You can get work with 
the printout and fact check it. You can then um, develop that writing further. You can then feed your writing back in and ask the tool to give you feedback on your writing so that you can improve it even further. So we, we now have a, a different tool that we can use to um, enhance students' learning experience. Mm -hmm. That's a really um, lovely way to look at it and actually a really positive piece around it. And I think it's the first time I've sort of heard it referred to as a, as a research tool versus a, you know, this really big bad thing uh, that's come to hit our education. But looking at it as another research tool um, and to use it in different ways, um, I think it's definitely a really positive way to look at it. Um, and with that, I'm sure will come some sort of mindset shift so people um, move away from the panic that's otherwise been created. Um, Alexandra, you're nodding. Um, I just wanted like to, to build on that, that a little bit and say that indeed <laughs> no. it, it, use it as a tool, but also as a acknowledging that it can be part of the learning process. So not banning it and saying, no, you cannot copy and, and submit what ChatGPT gave you as such, but you can, you know, submit that and your reflection on that or include it in one way or another, like, like, uh, uh, um, Chris said in the process, and I think making it explicit as a student and as a teacher is really important. So it's not all bad. It's not something to ban, but it's something that when used uh, well, it can really enhance the learning. Uh, it can, you know, make it more efficient. It can make it more, um, yeah, it can give opportunities for reflection, for self, uh, self assessment and, and so on. So I think there are lots of ways there, but again, as part of the process, not the output. Yes, absolutely. Thanks so much, Alexandra and, and Dominic. Anything final you'd like to add on on that? Yeah, well, well, two things, I, sort of relate, related things. And one of them is, you so say, what should universities do? I would say probably slow down a little bit. Don't try to box yourself and play in a place where saying this is what ChatGDP is going to be forevermore. As I keep saying, we just don't know all those things, everything that's coming, not just new technologies, but new uses, new ideas, new sort of workflows, new products. And one of the things that I'm sort of going to make a, a tentative prediction is that in five years' time, we're going to think about differently what it means to write an academic paper, not an assessment per se, an academic paper, because lots of disciplines have to produce a lot of writing, but it's not natural to them, like in the sciences and engineering, where people have lots of experimental data and they need to go and produce prose, and that's painful, expensive. Many people have to pay translators because English isn't their first language or copy editors. So this is, whereas now we can be in a place where most people will be using a tool like ChatGTP to help them take the, the structured data and make some prose that they can communicate better with it. And that's gonna be fairly normal. Whereas, whereas at the moment we kind of feel like for somebody to say I'm an author of something, I have to have typed every single letter with, with my fingers, but that I think is going to disappear very, uh, very, very slowly over time. And writing will be more like programming, whereas because in, in programming, people are very used to copying and pasting. That's how people learn to program and, and, and adapting what they what they got. So I think that's gonna come. And, and that kind of leads me to the second point is that we don't just need to think of this as, as a learning tool or teaching tool, but also as a teacher productivity tool. So one thing people can do, which our GDP teachers can do, is help them generate different kinds of explanation of the material, different examples, different uh, uh, different um, practice activities. And of course, all of those have to be checked. You cannot really trust anything that it comes out of it, but it's so much easier. We're in a stage where it's easier to check what it produces than start from scratch. In the previous generations of similar technologies, it was just easier to start from scratch than just kind of fix all those errors. But nowadays, it's easier to check. And, and that gives us opportunities to actually give students many more ways of practicing and accessing uh, learning opportunities because it's so hard to create examples, worked examples, uh, little sort of quick comprehension check quizzes. Those are all things that are really tedious to produce and we don't produce enough of them as teachers, as educators, I think. And that will be this new superpower. And of course, also being able to create code that can then make these things more interactive. Those are all things that are ha happening. So I think that would be my, the direction I'd be looking for. And those are the sessions that I'm running within Oxford of helping people think of this as a tool to help them being teachers and, and researchers and, and, and academics, because I think that's where the greatest potential is. Great, no, thank you, Dominic. Oh, sorry, Chris. Yeah. 
So I think I think your point about slowing down is really really important. So at, mm. at the Open University, we've taught with technology for for decades now. What we've learned is not to move too quickly. So students found it difficult to make the transition from broadcast TV to having videos in their own home. And then when we went to DVDs, they struggled with that transition to DVDs. And then we went to streaming, they struggled with that. And similarly, when we went from face to face tutorials to to synchronous tutorials through you know, formats like this, so. In the case of, of the software, it's currently free, and there's a good reason why it's free. They they want us to train it, right? Of course, they want us to effectively work with a tool which which will change our, our jobs. It's free at the moment, but it may well become a charge for a tool in the future for everyone because the tool itself costs quite a lot of money to, to run. So it, if, we, if we get too deeply into this, we may need to think about the cost implications of that. So we, we need to think carefully about it, but also students move slower than we sometimes imagine. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. And I think it's really interesting to bring out sort of the, the risk factor as well of it being fully open now, but will it always be? Um, and, you know, um, definitely like students move at their own pace. Uh, and we've seen that over many, many years at McGraw Hill. Uh, but I like this concept of around the, the teacher productivity of how could it, how can we use it to make the, the teacher experience better um, and I think having that caveat always in mind of we need to check um, and not take it for granted I think is a big piece around the education of something as new and as innovative as this um, as an approach moving forward um, and I guess I've got one last question before we hop on to Q&A which was around so we've talked a lot about like the assessment um, there's a number of questions around academic integrity and plagiarism uh, but what effect do we feel like this is going to have on the future of jobs and the skills that we're going to have to prep students with who will or will not encounter it but will probably find it at some place in work because um, you know i can see it having been in industry myself already that, that there are going to be companies that will be using this for all sorts of other pieces but um how, how can you see it's going to affect that? Um, and I think I'm going to come to Alexandra first because I know you do a lot of work at Maastricht around employability skills and prepping the students for tomorrow. Um, and obviously, this is going to become a big part of that. But I wonder if, if you wouldn't mind sharing your perspective on the effects that you see it's going to have um, on, on jobs of tomorrow. Yeah, definitely. It's it's really an important. Uh, it's part of an important, let's say, set of skills that that students need to uh, need to acquire, or you know, it's ideally should acquire while at university, uh, and not only, but while at university primarily, um, and uh, or at least they're expected to go with those skills into the workforce. And it's not always the case entirely, but still, um, what we are doing about it, at, at least, um, I I wouldn't say at the moment we're using technology too much. On, or too meaningfully uh, in that uh, in that respect, unfortunately, um, and there is much more potential there. But uh, I just wanted to point out, just just generally remind ourselves that I don't know, five, ten years uh, back, we were not even discussing that much. I was involved in using technology in education, just generally, you know, in e-learning and whatever we called it in back in the day. Uh, but the interest uh, in in terms of you know faculty being interested in using technology was quite. Uh, reduced. Uh, it was it was a niche, uh, and of course the the pandemic changed that by necessity. Um, and now the whole debate with ChatGTP is changing it further, hopefully for the better. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think it's still a need. Uh, we, we are still in need of a of a mind shift there. That that like Dominic said, this can be a help. I mean, it, we don't need to trust it fully. We don't need to only use technology, but let's explore how it can help us especially to develop the, those skills um i mean when i talk about skills here it's about everything i mean digital literacy it's part of it in a way um but it's also a little bit uh, i would say digital literacy is part of what i would call knowledge literacy or knowledge management um mm -hmm. so it's all about you know checking things again checking making sure not trusting everything we read uh, but also yeah. knowing the mechanisms behind those technologies because really what i'm most as i said in the very beginning what i'm most afraid with chat gpt is that very very few people know the mechanism behind it and therefore knows mm -hmm. know how to use it properly to do the prompt engineering which i think is key here what you ask what you feed it will really determine you know how you can make the most of it so i think just working with students with those things trying it over and over having them try it without um uh, you know uh, putting in danger their uh, uh, grades 
you know, making it a safe space, like a playground for them to use these or other technologies, because there will be many others, uh, having them come to us with, with new technologies, with new things, and us as teachers being open to that, uh, to experimenting together with them. I think this, this should be the way to go. Unfortunately, not many institutions give the space uh, for that to happen. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, Alexandra. Um, uh, Chris, um, Dominic, anything you wanted to add on that before we go to the Q&A? Dominic? Well, may maybe just, <laughs> I'm always a bit wary about the employability sort of discourse when it comes to higher education, because particularly when it comes to tools, right? Tools change and, uh, and you know, so we used to say, well, people are going to be using Microsoft Office and in, in, in the workplace, we need to use Microsoft Office, but that's, those are relatively yeah. trivial things to learn, right? Those, those, those things. So it's, so higher education really is, is well, in as much as we know what it's for, but, but it's more about a place for kind of maturation, for, for, uh, for exploring ideas, for maybe sort of acquiring uh, uh, maps of meaning and you know, content, well, you know, maps of meaning is a bit confusing, but, uh, but that's the, that, that's where I would sort of say that maybe I wouldn't want to say because people will be using something in the workplace, we need to necessarily teach it or use it directly mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. there is a long process of, 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 of sort of people adapting things to a particular purpose, things change quickly. So I'm not, I'm not necessarily sure mm -hmm. that that's where we should be going, but we should definitely be, be aware of the fact that this is part of the world and we should not wall ourselves from it as part of the world, employment, personal, uh, personal life, and you know and, and study as well so that's i would sort of perhaps take, take that tack sure mm. no absolutely makes sense um and chris uh, any final thoughts well s simply in the area that we work in which is health and social care the the emphasis is particularly still on people with good people skills interacting mm -hmm. with other people it might be for, for those practitioners that these um, content generating tools could play a role in their um, written communications it's unclear mm -hmm. but I, I think we should be encouraging or at least building it into our educational process so students have an understanding of its capa you know, cap capacities and its limitations. No, thank you, Chris. Um, so we're now going to flip over to the Q&A. Thank you so much, everybody, for all the questions. I can see there's actually questions pouring in in the chat and the Q&A as, as expected um, around the topic. So I'm going to cover a couple of them. I don't think we'll be able to do all of them, but we'll take some of those away and be able to feed back to, to all of you. So the first, first question that I'd like to cover is one that we've had from David Nicholl. Um, and he's asked, how, how would we use chat GPT to improve feedback processes, um, given that if prompted, it might be able to write better feedback um, and include examples than, than perhaps the teacher could. Um, so any any thoughts about how uh, we could use it to improve feedback? Any any thoughts from, from the group here? I don't mind who takes that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just want to quickly point out, I don't think necessarily can give better feedback than a teacher because he doesn't know the student, doesn't know the history, doesn't know, doesn't know sort of the conceptual uh, aspects of it. But I do know a colleague who gives, uses it to give feedback to students because they're not a native speaker of English and it helps them <laughs> translate their comments, which kind of understand the student's needs into an English that is flows easier. So that's kind of an example of it can be as a tool to help you help you produce better text, right? So that's that's an example where I would say you can do it. I mean, the, the one I mentioned, the, the, the ability to produce interactive, uh, interactive, somebody mentioned in the chat, the formative assessments, right? So produce more of those so that students can get more self-feedback on their own learning. Mm -hmm. That That is another element of it. So I'd, I would be wary of saying it can give better feedback. It can give, it can transform things into other things in useful, interesting ways. <laughs> and sometimes that could look like feedback. But that's not really what it's doing. So, so definitely, you need to have that human in the loop, and not just say I pasted something in and got some feedback uh, back. But, but uh, definitely, will play a big role in uh, in sort of empowering everybody to uh, to interact with what they're learning better. Excellent, great, thank you. 
I just wanted that. to build on that a little bit because also knowing David and his framework for feedback, I think uh, it can really, I, I was just thinking actually recently about how ChatGPT could feature into that. And I think um, definitely it wouldn't, I wouldn't say it can fully replace the teacher uh, feedback, nor should it, but it can mm -hmm. be, as I mm -hmm. said before, part of the process. So generating sort of first level of feedback or however you want to call it, comments on what the students, uh, what the student wrote so that the student can um you know reflect on it him or herself and and sort of generate their own feedback so i think this can be an interesting tool for that at this point in time we don't know how this will develop maybe the tool will get much better uh, but in any case including it in that feedback process and self-feedback pro process can be useful so that also also for the teacher in a way because when the work gets to the teacher then the teacher should be having a little bit less work to do but i think it's a matter of how you design the course and and the assessment process itself but it, i can see some benefits for it there brilliant thank you alexandra chris any any last words on that question at all well, well certainly thoughtful nuanced feedback is, is at the moment mm -hmm. something that there will be um, more likely to produce, be produced by a human than chat GPT. So the experience of fiddling about I've done with it, which is asking for feedback has been at a fairly general level. Uh, so I can't see it replacing that, but it, certainly it is a way of, of perhaps getting going with, with a, an approach to feedback, but I'm not saying Absolutely. much more at the moment. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so we're coming to another question from Masood Mehafdi. I hope I've pronounced your name right. Um, and the question is around academic integrity, which as we all know is a big part of, of what the sort of general academic response has been. Um, and his question is, of what advice can, can you all give to help academic misconduct officers when investigating cases of suspected academic misconduct where G chat GBT may have been used by students? Um, and I think, Chris, you talked a little bit about academic misconduct um, through your previous remit. So I don't know if you'd like mm -hmm. to, to, to start, start us off with a response um, on some advice that you can give to misconduct officers. I, I, I... I think this is a really, really difficult area. There are mm. tools that can be used to detect, um, you know, the use of of AI. Um, they generally they don't seem to be very reliable. That the text that can be submitted itself can be um, tweaked more or um, generated in a way that makes it more likely to be avoided, um, or at least avoid detection by these tools. And and unlike other tools like Turnitin, where you're, you're linked to the source material and you still need to have a human in there to make an interpretation about that, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure this software can do it. Chat GPT itself can detect plagiarized text. You can put material in it, it can identify where it comes from itself. Mm -hmm. the, the the other area that I think we're we're starting to that I'm starting to see a little bit of um, talk about is is where we're starting to take retrogressive steps. In responding to it, so for example, asking students to hand in handwritten assignments, um, asking for people to start going into exams again, um, impromptu vivas is another one. So ringing people up, I select a random number of people and having vivas. That, that's another solution. There's a software call mm -hmm. tool called Auth Plus, which seems to be doing a kind of AI-based viva. So I, I don't think any of these are, are going to take us uh, you know, anywhere helpful in the future. In, in terms of this, this this text, there may be ways of setting assignments differently. So if, if we're asking students to set um, fairly formulaic assessment tasks that can be responded to um, from AI, then I think they may not be the right tasks for our students. So I think at, at, at the, the bottom, mm. um, you know, the, the first line in this is to set better assessments, is to change the way we assess things. So instead yeah, of asking yeah. students, um, what are the features of an age-friendly society, send them out, ask them to, to assess their own high street. You know, mm. Is my high street age-friendly? Um, something more personal, something um, less formulaic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's flipping a model that we've known for so long um, and it's giving us an opportunity, hopefully, to, to assess in different ways. There's a bit, very strong correlation there. And obviously, we know um, one of the core measures at universities is assessment um, because that's that's the sort of output. But yeah, using it as sort of the, the application, being the true assessment and using the tool to, to, to better some of that um, 100%. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Alexandra, Chris, any any thoughts on on the question um, that was asked around academic misconduct? Any advice to give to them? 
don't worry if not. <laughs> no, just similar to, very similar to what Chris said, is really going back to the assessment and trying to figure out, you know, reassessing what's human in, in how we formulate assessment and trying to enforce that part or at least add that part and not have only, um, yeah, things that can be easily uh, created uh, by, uh, generated by ChatGPT. Sure, thank you, thanks. Um, and Dominic, any last words on that? I don't have anything about the core of it because obviously Chris um, uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. kind of outlined all, 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 all the thing. Uh, and, uh, but one thing that hasn't changed that much, uh, it's actually amazing how cheap uh, it is to pay somebody to write an essay for you. <laughs> Uh, I was quite surprised because I have a colleague who's done a lot of research on this, and and they will produce better results than ChatGDP. They will. They, people have even given people like that access to their VLE, all the assignments, and they'll do it for fifty dollars to do this. Uh, because the people do often in Kenya, in the Philippines, there's lots of people who are really good writers, and uh, and that's how and they write copy for marketing companies. And occasionally, if somebody asks them, they'll write an essay for them as well. And they'll tailor yeah. it much better than ChatGDP could do. So so in some ways, I think. We're sort of overestimating how much people could do already with this. But mm -hmm. as a second bit of warning, uh, <laughs> I just heard yesterday about a new use case for ChatGDP to be used to, to get around an academic integrity, which is not to write the thing for you, but to take something that you've copied from somewhere and rewrite it mm -hmm. <laughs> in a way that then wow. isn't detectable by Turnitin. So many of those sort of paper mills are on Turnitin, so it's, it's very easy to get caught. But if you then paste, mm -hmm. if you run it through ChatGDP, then it may not be as easy to be to be identified. And I only heard about it yesterday, and I haven't thought of it myself. But that, and I don't know if people are using it, but that would be one use case of this uh, to get around academic integrity. But again, going back to the Chris's point from at the very beginning, people actually don't cheat that much, you know. And those who do, they have some really good options already. So I'm not all that worried about it myself. It's not something that I spend a lot of time thinking about. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Dominic. And um, I can see we're coming up to four minutes um, till the end of the session. Um, and there are a couple more questions that, that we could cover, probably, but it would take us to time. So uh, we're going to we're going to call it a day there. I think there are some really key takeaways here um, around sort of striking the balance of the use of, of chat GPT um, in higher education. There is obviously impact um, of, of a new technology about placing it in sort of different ways but definitely the big t biggest takeaway was to you know take take it with a pinch of salt in terms of what we are placing in chat gpt but it can be used um in all sorts of different ways it can be used um through sort of reshaping assessment um but you know a student and the academics are a core part of that uh, but equally um looking at it as sort of a, a research sort of tool i think that's been quite a sort of eye-opening for me personally um of looking at it in a different way um so there's 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 definitely a lot more about this conversation to continue so what we will do is we'll take away um all the rest of the questions that we didn't get to um and we'll we'll have our panelists sort of give a bit of a perspective and share those with you all afterwards um so thank you uh chris dominic and alexandra i've really appreciated uh you guys joining us today and for sharing your perspective um a note to everyone that this session will be available um, um, on demand as soon as the session finishes so you'll be able to go back in and access on demand um, and hear it all over again uh, should you want to um, and that is the end of our first day of the virtual conference and i'd like to just say a big thank you to all our audience for all the engagement in the chat in the q a um, all of our wonderful speakers that have spoken today um, it's been great to have all of you here um, as a combined community and uh, for those of you who won't be joining day two feel free to to go to the lobby and fill in a survey on day one uh, but if you'll be joining us tomorrow we'll be uh, kickstarting tomorrow morning um, at 10 a.m and of course you can dial in to, to whichever sessions um, um, you'd like to um, so we look forward to seeing you tomorrow um, key highlights of stuff we will be talking about tomorrow will be assessment no doubt chat gbt will feature in the assessment session uh, as we think about the future of assessment uh, but we'll also have um, a session around technology for engagement um, edi and the role of data analytics as well so please do tune in tomorrow um, and again a huge thank you to all of you who've joined us from all parts of the world today and our wonderful speakers today so thank you so much um, and we wish you all a pleasant afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.